So this morning, we're going through Matthew chapter 8 and 9. Really, it should be two weeks it takes us to go through this. I'm feeling optimistic this morning. So when we first started to go through Matthew, I'd introduced that we were going to uh, that we were going to start in Christmas to Easter. We were going to cover all of Matthew in that time frame. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Taking far too long going through this. So we're going to break around Easter time. We're going to jump to the end of Matthew. They're going to keep going probably for maybe a month past that. But as I was kind of mapping this out and, and trying to figure out how to get this in a reasonable timeline, I really combined Matthew chapter 8 and 9 should be done separately for time's sake. We're going to try and do it this morning, so pray for me that I would not be long-winded, <laughs> um, which I know sometimes is not uh, all that possible, but we're going to try it. So as we talked about, though, at the beginning of Matthew, we kicked this off, we talked about the fact that Matthew is not listed in chronological order. That I mean, there are certainly there are parts that it goes along a timeline, but for the, for the most part, it's not necessarily chronological. What we see in Matthew is that it's designed and structured intentionally uh, and thematically. You know, so there's Matthew is broken up into five distinct sections. And what we see is that Matthew presents a teaching of Jesus, and then he re responds to that next with showing that in deed. So it's ministry in work and his ministry in deed. So this morning we're going to start in Matthew chapter 8. Uh, but first, if you would just turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, we're just going to Spend one, uh, just a moment there, Matthew 4.23. So what we saw there is that he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So I take us back here because this is a summary of Jesus' ministry. You know, the, again, the 30,000 foot view, that's his ministry on earth. And what we see, again, is the ministry in word, in deed. We see teaching, the synagogues, proclaiming, preaching the gospel, the kingdom. So we see this, you know, word is teaching and preaching. And then we see in deed as well that he goes around healing every disease, every affliction. So last week we looked at Matthew 5 to 7, the, the Sermon on the Mount. So that's the teaching portion uh, of this section. We're getting to the next section now, 8 and 9, where we're seeing Jesus' ministry in deed and seeing his healing. So what we had saw at the end of, uh, of the message last week is Matthew 7, 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one who had authority. So that's what we're looking at this morning. We're looking at the king's authority. You know, we saw it in teaching last week. We're going to see his authority in healing uh, primarily this week. But as we get into Matthew uh, chapter 8 and 9, the bottom line here is that we're going to see today is this, that Jesus possesses absolute authority in the world, and as a result of that, he warrants absolute allegiance from the world. So Jesus is the authority over, you know, our entire lives is authority over sickness, over disease, over suffering, over everything. But as we get to Matthew 8, we're going to see the portrait of, of Jesus that Matthew paints uh, in, in chapter 8. So if you just open with me there, we're going to break this out today. We're going to read through all of this text, which is why this is optimistic this morning. But we're going to read through the whole thing, uh, but just section at a time. So we're going to read the first four verses, and then we're going to go from there. So it starts by saying, when he came down from the mountain, this again, this is after the Sermon on the Mount, after he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. So the first thing that we see this morning is that Jesus has authority over disease. So today we're going to look at, we're going to start by looking at three miracle stories. The first story is that Jesus cleanses the physically unclean. So this is a leper that we see Jesus coming, and the leper asks to heal him. And it's important, he says, he cleanses him, not that he heals him. It's an important distinction made there. Because in first century Judaism, to be a leper wasn't just looked at as a physical condition. It was also looked at as a spiritual 
contagion. You know, it's looked that maybe his sin caused this, um, and to come in contact with him uh, was something that you just would not do. They were put to the outskirts of the city. So they were considered unclean, that they were actually cursed by God. Uh, and if you were to touch a leper, you're basically defiling yourself. And so it's very intentional here that Jesus actually touches the leper. But what's interesting in the next verse here, we say, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. So the leper here, he's acknowledging, he knows that Jesus is able to heal him. Now, that's not a question in his mind. His question is, he doesn't know if Jesus is willing to heal him. So essentially, what we need to understand, and we need to understand this throughout the whole message today, is that there is a distinction being made between God's sovereign power that we just sang about and his sovereign will. So Jesus can heal you, but is he willing? You know, is it his will that you be healed? So the answer in Matthew chapter 8, as we see, the answer is yes. Jesus is willing to heal. But if we go to 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul is talking about the thorn in the flesh, asking that God would take that away from him, the answer there is no. Because God's saying, I want to leave you with this so you remember that I am your strength and your weakness. You know, I want to leave this with you because there is something more important than you being healed from a physical ailment. It's a reminder that the spiritual is much more important than the physical. So as you pray, remember that the most important thing is that you know that God has sovereign power. But what is the sovereign will in that? What is the sovereign will in that situation? So as we continue on, we see that, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. So Jesus is saying, you know, don't tell anyone what happened. And sometimes we focus on that saying, okay, so since he told uh, the leper to tell no one, clearly he has to obey that command and he doesn't tell anyone. We don't know if he tells anyone really or not or how many people he might tell. The point isn't so much on the leper. The point is on the heart that Jesus has behind this. The point is that Jesus has not come to be known as a wonder worker, as a miracle worker. That's not why he came to earth. He's not coming to, uh, you know, as some would expect, to actually overthrow that Roman power, that brutal Roman empire that is ruling over the Jewish people. You know, that's not his point with these miracles. He's coming to show them that the kingdom of God is here. You know, he's coming to make a way for people to know the king. So when he tells them, you know, don't make this known, it's because that's not what he wants to be known for. All right, so that's a distinction that we can take from this first uh, text here in Matthew chapter 8. So moving on now to the second story uh, in verses 5 to 13. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. So the first thing we saw is that Jesus cleanses the physically unclean, but now we see that Jesus is healing the ethnically outcast. So the centurion, he's representing that Roman rule. So we talked uh, at length before that the Romans are this brutal, overwhelming power in the land. And as a Jewish person, you would much less ever go into, someone's home, uh, into a, a Gentile's home. You wouldn't even want to have association with a Gentile. So to even think about going to their home and entering their home was completely uh, something that would never, ever happen. So when Jesus says in verse 7 that I will come, that should be shocking. Right? He says, I will come and heal him. But what becomes more shocking is the next verse, the centurion's response. He says, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. He says, for I too am a man under authority. He's recognizing the authority that Jesus has. 
uh, with soldiers under me. And I say to him, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. Again, the centurion recognizing the authority that Jesus has and the authority that he has over his soldiers, the authority over his servants, he's recognizing that Jesus has that same authority over sickness. He's comparing sickness, essentially, to a servant. The sickness is a servant to Jesus. In response, Jesus says, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. So that begs the question, what kind of faith is this that he's talking about? You know, if this is the most profound example of faith that Jesus has, has seen, you know, what kind of faith is that? And I think what we see very clearly, that again, it's faith that is trusting in the authority of Jesus. That's the kind of faith that the centurion has. You know, we recognize that he has authority over suffering, over sickness, over paralysis in this case. It is his servant. So that's the second story. Third, he restores the culturally marginalized. Right, so all three of these stories, we see a theme. They're all pointing to people that are on the outskirts of Jewish society, on the outskirts of Jewish culture. Because the first, we have the leper, literally on the outsides of the city, the outskirts of the city. Second, a Gentile, who the Jews did not like to associate with. And third, we have a woman who in those days was oftentimes considered a second-class citizen. So we have all these people that are on the outskirts of their society who Jesus is coming and reaching out to and healing. So we go to verse uh, 14, and we see that and when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. So again, that's the third healing story that we see. But Matthew concludes these three stories with two verses. And we want to take a quick look at those. First in verse 16, it says, That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. And then verse 17, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. So if that sounds familiar, it's because Matthew is quoting there from Isaiah chapter 53. You know, we don't have time to, to go there this morning, but that's the passage where it talks about, you know, he bore diseases, our afflictions. That it's this passage about the suffering servant. So that's the prophecy that Matthew is pulling from to illustrate here that it's looking forward to the substitutionary death of Christ on the cross. That's what Matthew is using to ground this passage in. So Matthew is showing us that Jesus has the authority to overcome all suffering, but grounding that in the reality that Jesus, according to, Matthew, or according to Isaiah 53, has paid the price to overcome our sin. All right, so why is that important? Why is it important that he draw that connection, that he grounded in Isaiah 53? What he's showing here is that all suffering ultimately goes back to sin entering the world. If you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, before sin, there is no suffering. Sin enters the world, suffering follows. So when Jesus goes to the cross, again, the reason why he quotes it from this here, when Jesus goes to the cross, he's not just addressing the symptoms. Right? He's addressing the root problem. He's going and he's addressing, he's conquering sin. Because you kill sin, suffering ends with it. So what these miracles are doing, they're giving us a picture of what it is to come into the fullness of God's kingdom. You know, when God's kingdom is fully here, this is what it will look like. There will be no power of suffering, no power of sin in our lives. But until then, until Christ fully and finally asserts his authority, until he fully asserts his reign, his rule over our lives here on the earth, until then there will still be suffering. Right? That's a reality of our world that we live in. So if we go to Romans 5, we see, in the meantime, that we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts with the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And in Romans 8, we see the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So that's the message that Paul had for us. 
that suffering is still part of this world, but we're to rejoice in that, that there's something greater coming. There's a future glory coming that is going to far outweigh any suffering, any results of sin that we experience in this life. Oh, in 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 to 19, again, we won't look there this morning, but Paul is talking about these troubles and afflictions of life, saying that they are just light and momentary things. You know, that's something that we have to put up with for a little while. But it's preparing us for the surpassing, these sufferings are preparing us for the surpassing glory that's going to far away anything, any suffering that we experience here on earth. So that's the first thing that we saw, that Jesus has authority over disease. The next thing, and we're going to go through six things this morning, is that Jesus has authority over disciples. So in this passage on, a lot of this is dealing with healing this morning on sickness. He pauses here and talks about potential disciples in verse 18. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. If you look at the first man, he hasn't counted the cost of discipleship. And I don't want to spend too much time here, but this is ultimately what I believe is the root problem of the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel. We say, come to Jesus and get. You know, come to Jesus and get a house, get a car, get riches, get listed on and on and on. And that's what point Jesus is making here. You haven't counted the cost of discipleship. You know, it's come to Jesus and get Jesus. Not all those other things. So Jesus, what we see, is worthy of our undivided affection. Jesus has to be more important to us than anything else that we experience or could have or own or, again, the list goes on in this life. Because going back to what we saw in Romans, there's something far greater that awaits us. So that's the first potential disciple. The second potential disciple says, let me go back and bury my father. Now this is oftentimes looked at kind of controversially, saying, oh, really a man can't go bury his father? Uh, you know, we're told in Scripture to honor our parents. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because there's probably a lot of rabbit holes we could go down. And, you know, some, some would say, well, maybe he wanted to go back for an inheritance first. The point is that following Jesus, undivided affection is more important. I think that's the point being made here, that Jesus needs to be more important than family. Not that family shouldn't be important. It's that Jesus must be more important. You know, because if it wasn't going back to bury his father, it probably would have been something else. Or it always could be an excuse. Well, I've got to deal with this first, and then I'll follow you. I believe that's the point being made here. I think uh, J.C. Rowell sums this up fairly well by saying that nothing has done more harm to Christianity than the practice of filling the ranks of Christ's army with every volunteer who is willing to make a little profession. All right, so we make it very easy to be a follower of Christ. You know, we don't, we don't set the bar very high. And that's not saying that we have to work for our salvation. Nothing could be further from the truth. But Jesus, as we see very clearly from this passage, is not begging for followers. He's, instead, he's turning them away. Right? So it's showing we, he requires our undivided allegiance. He's not saying if you just, you know, if you pray a prayer and your life doesn't change, that's fine. You know, just believe in me. We're going to see in a few moments, that the demons believe in Christ, um, and that doesn't turn out too well for them. So the importance here requires our undivided allegiance in following Jesus. So he's authority over disciples. He also has the authority over disaster or over nature itself. So look at verses 23 to 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this, that even winds and sea obey him? So a number of weeks ago, uh, David touched on uh, this very thing when he was speaking on faith. And from his 
um, vantage point as a sailor. He has a certain appreciation for this that I could never have. But I don't want to, again, talk so much about that. What I want to look at is what is the point of this passage? And the point is in verse 27. The response of what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? They recognize that only God could do this. That no mere man could have this effect on nature. And what they would recall is Psalm 89.8 where we say, O Lord God of hosts, you rule the raging of the sea. When, it wa when its waves rise, you still them. And in Psalm 107, he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. So the disciples are marveling because they recognize that God's in the boat with them. That's the, we can go in a lot of different places. If I was getting seasick, I might want to, you know, talk about how great that is, that he can calm the seas and I don't have to be throwing up overboard. I'm sure David appreciates that with the drugs that he has to take to make sure that doesn't happen. But the point of the story, the ultimate point is that Jesus is God. That's the point that the disciples, if not for the first time, are beginning to really realize, wait, this man is not just a mere man. There's something more. So he has authority over disease, disciples, disaster, and demons. So we get to the next story here in verse 28. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tomb so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. So again, there's a lot in this passage as well. But what I want to focus on today is that these demons have fear because of their belief. Right, we talked before about the fear of God and how all of us should have fear of God, but that's not the type of fear necessarily that we're talking about here. What we're talking about here is that the demons have clearly believe in Jesus. And the response is fear. Because they believe in Jesus, they believe in the authority that he has. They know that they, he can cast them out, they, he can send them wherever he wants. He can do whatever he wants with them. He has the authority completely over them. And the irony is that sometimes we have fear because of our unbelief. So we struggle with fear because we lack the faith of demons, essentially. You know, that should disturb us a little bit, that if demons have more faith than us, we should probably look within ourselves a little bit. You know, because the demons believe you know, that they recognize that Jesus has ultimate authority, and because of that, he has the complete dominion over their lives or over their existence. So Jesus has authority over everything. And I think if we realize what they realize, if we truly realize that, we'd recognize that we have no reason to fear when things come about in our life. And that's no reason to fear when suffering comes along, when disease, when affliction, when struggles come along. Again, this isn't talking about the fear of God. That's something else entirely. But just those fear when situations present, ourselves, present themselves in our lives, if we had even the fear or the belief of demons, we'd be in a much better condition today, I believe. But then verse 29 comes along and it says, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? So before the time, they're recognizing, they know that their time on earth is limited. They know that there's a day coming when Jesus will come, his kingdom will come in fullness, and they will be judged and they will be sent to the lake of fire. You know, so they know that there's going to be that time coming, as we've talked in the past, we talked last week, the Lord's Prayer, that his kingdom will come, his will will be done on a new earth as it is in heaven. But because of what Jesus did at the cross, he has conquered sin at the root. And they recognize that knowing there's a time coming when that will be a reality and fullness in all of our lives. So that's Matthew chapter 8. That wasn't too bad. I, I'm impressed with myself there. Um, we might get this done on time after all. 
But that's Matthew chapter 8. So what we see in Matthew chapter 8 is it's dealing with things that aren't necessarily all that beautiful to look at. So when we get into Matthew chapter 9, rather than 8 where we are looking at very external things, you know, we're dealing with things that are surface issues, chapter 9 then digs beneath the surface. It gets to the heart, the root of these conditions that we're, we've looked at in, verse, uh, or in, sorry, in chapter 8. Essentially, it's addressing the real issue. It's addressing sin. So we'll start in Matthew chapter 9. We'll read the first eight verses. And getting into a boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, This man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and went home. When the crowd saw it, they were afraid, and they glorified God, who had given such authority to men. So what we're, we see here very clearly is that Jesus has authority over sin. And you come to this passage, and when you look at it, you can be left a little bit baffled for a couple of reasons. The first is we see this is the only time in the entire book of Matthew where Jesus says to a specific individual, your sins are forgiven. And what can be even more baffling is that the man didn't ask for it. He comes, he wants to be healed. And he says, your sins are forgiven. He's recognizing this man, even though he is paralyzed, he has a greater need. Again, it's digging to the root issue, not just the surface issues. And again, in those days, they may have believed that his, his uh, affliction was caused by sin. We're not told that that's the case, but that was a common belief. So even if that was the case, Jesus is saying very clearly, you have a problem that is much greater than any surface issue. There is a spiritual issue that you have a much greater need for. So all of these miracles are coming to a head here in, in Matthew chapter 9. As we see now, Jesus' authority is penetrating to the root of all suffering, which we talked about. It's penetrating to the root, which is sin. It's getting right down to the core issue and showing that our ultimate need is never physical. Our ultimate need is always spiritual. And we talked about already that Paul's thorn in the, in the flesh in God not healing him, he's showing very clearly that your spiritual need is far greater than your physical need. So I'm going to leave you this physical issue, this physical aim, ailment, whatever it is, we don't know. I'm going to leave this issue with you so you're always reminded of how much you need me that in your weakness I will be your strength. So that's the good news of the kingdom, that our ultimate need is never physical. You know, because in Matthew chapter 8 and 9, as we're going through this today, what we're seeing very clearly that Jesus is God. Jesus is the king, and that this king has come. The king has come. He's reigning today in our lives. So the good news isn't about healing disease. The good news is about forgiveness of sin. That's the good news we see from Matthew 8 and 9. 2 Corinthians 4.16 says that though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. That's the point of all this. That's the, the takeaway that we need to recognize that the outer self, we can get caught up in that, but the point is that the inner self being, uh, be renewed on a daily basis. So Jesus has authority over sin. He also has authority to save. So that's what we see next as we get into uh, verse 9. As Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as Jesus reclined at table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. 
Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came to call the righteous, for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So we see here in the context of this passage that Jesus is surrounded by crowds. You know, you get all these people that are following him. You know, he's getting all this attention, but then he spots Matthew. Again, much like the centurion, maybe even more so, would have been despised by his fellow Jews. Because here, and we've talked about it in the past, here's this Jewish person who is helping support the Roman rule and reign over their lives. Basically saying, if one of us in here was to, was to say, okay, this foreign power comes in and takes us over, and we're going to devote our lives to taking money from you to make sure that you stay enslaved. That's Matthew. And that's who Jesus picks out from the crowd to go and say, follow me. And it's a clear picture that, again, this is Matthew speaking of himself. Remember, Matthew is the one who wrote this. Matthew is unclean. He's an outsider. He's, again, taking advantage of God's people. And this is the person that Jesus goes to and says, I want you to follow me. That shows that there's no one that Jesus won't reach out to. He's probably the lowest bar in society from a Jewish perspective, and Jesus wants him. It's also a clear picture that Jesus pursues sinners. Right? That is who he is calling. That is who he wants to have follow him. And Matthew, you know, he leaves behind, in, in, in receiving this calling, he leaves behind his post. He leaves behind uh, his position, his, his possessions, you know, his, his safety, his security. You know, if this didn't work out with Jesus, there's no going back and getting a job somewhere else. No one's going to hire this guy. He's not going to be able to go back to work for the Romans. His life, from an earthly perspective, is officially over when he decides to follow Jesus. There's no turning back from that. And that's the picture that we get in following. You know, that may not be the case for all of us, but there's that question, are we willing to follow Jesus at the expense of suffering, of loss in this life? And of course, the Pharisees, those who knew their Bibles, their, the Scripture, the Old Testament Scriptures, better than anybody, they didn't like this too much. But if we talk time and time again, they missed the heart of the message. You know, they missed the reason for the law in the Old Testament. You know, they were caught up in just rules and regulations. They weren't caught up in what the intent of the law was. So as we look at ourselves as a church, I pray that we would never get caught up in just the words and become very intellectual and knowledgeable and not have that reflect in our lives, both individually and as a church. But moving on to verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk, unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment, and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, so both are preserved. So why are the disciples not fasting? We see that that's the question we're dealing with here. In verse 15, what Jesus says is, the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Now, we've talked in the past about the picture of the, the bride and the bridegroom, the, the bride being the church, and that's a, a theme throughout Scripture. We're not going to have time to touch on that this morning. But the picture is that Jesus is saying, as long as the bridegroom is here, you should be feasting, not fasting. And what we often do is, you know, fasting is, is associated with mourning in the Old Testament. That's the picture we see over and over again. If you're fasting, it's, it's not something that's positive in any way. It's, it's maybe because someone has, has died or you're fasting because uh, you're looking forward to the coming of Christ and, and it's a somber experience. And Jesus is saying that right now, it's not a time to fast, it's a time to feast. So what we see at the end of verse 15 is that the day will come when the bridegroom is, t- is taken away from them, and then they will fast. So now, today, 
Jesus is saying very clearly that we should fast. We should be fasting now, but why? Because if we look back, now the king has come. He is here, so why do we need to fast? And that's where we've got to recognize that there's a significant difference between Old Testament fasting and New Testament fasting. Because in the Old Testament, they're always looking forward. They're anticipating, they're longing for, they're, they're aching for the king to come. But in the New Testament, they're looking backward and forward. You know, the king has come, but there's more to come still. So it's a much different type of fasting. So the structure of this is important, too, because if we look at Matthew 9, uh, 14 to 17 out of context, you'll miss the point. Because this picture, we have this picture of Jesus in the midst of these mourning, these uh, fasting, and this feasting. It's the middle of nine different miracle stories. Right? This story just kind of plopped in the middle there in the middle of these people that are struggling with disease and uh, struggling with sickness, struggling with demons, the picture that we need to draw from that today is if there is sickness, if there is struggle, if there are all those things that we're dealing with in our lives, there's a reminder that something better is coming. Right? So we should crave the consummation of the kingdom in our lives, the consummation of the rule and reign of Christ in our lives. That is the something better that is coming. So the next thing we see is that Jesus has also authority over death. So we'll read verses 18 to 26. While he was saying these things to them, behold, a ruler came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. And when Jesus came to the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, go away for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. And the report of this went throughout all that district. So Jesus has authority over death. So we've got this woman who is ceremonially unclean. And Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Again, it's another picture of this strong faith is what it required for her healing. So we see that Jesus gives hope in the midst of despair, but then we also see that he brings life in the midst of death. And I'm going to talk for a few minutes longer on that. So we see the, the second part of the passage which is, we just read, that there's a funeral that's already begun. You know, the food players are there. There's a crowd that's gathered. And Jesus comes and says, go home. You know, there's not, nothing to see here. You know, she's just sleeping. They laugh at him, of course. Uh, but then she is risen from the dead. This is a foretaste of what is to come, right? So we see that Jesus, in a few chapters from now, is going to die, but then he raises again on his own authority. You know, we should be seeing that very clearly, clearly today, that Jesus has authority over all these things. He rises again on his own authority. I came across a quote by a Canadian scientist, G.B. Hardy, that I want to read this morning. It says that when I looked at religion, I said, I have two questions. One, has anybody ever conquered death? And two, if they have, did they make a way for me to conquer death? So again, this is a scientist who at this time was not a believer. He was someone who was searching. He says, so I checked the tomb of Buddha, and it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Confucius, of Confucius and it was occupied. I checked the tomb of Muhammad, and it was occupied. And I came to the tomb of Jesus, and it was empty. And I said, there is one who has conquered death. And I asked the second question, did he make a way for me to do it? And I opened the Bible and discovered that he had said, because I live, you shall live also. So with Jesus, death is temporary. We're told that to live is Christ, to die is gain. So that's the, the point being made there, that Jesus has authority over death. The next thing we see as we're getting closer to drawing to a conclusion today is that Jesus has authority over disability. So two more stories briefly, uh, starting at verse 27. 
And as Jesus passed on from there, two blind men followed him, crying aloud, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were opened. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about it. But they went away and spread his fame through all that district. So we're told very clearly here that they did not listen to Jesus, that they went and spread his fame anyway. What I want to draw out here is we see, first of all, they say, have mercy on us, son of David. Okay, so they're recognizing who Jesus is. This is the first time someone other than Matthew calls Jesus by this name, a son of David. And there'd be a clear recognition, if they're calling him the son of David, they're recognizing that he is the promised Messiah. So they know who he is, and they recognize this Old Testament promise from Isaiah 35 that the eyes of the blind shall be opened when the Messiah comes. So even in their blindness, they could see what the Pharisees and scribes had missed. Again, so may we not get too caught up in the words and not take the heart and the meaning behind what's in this book. Finally, Jesus has authority over the devil. So we come now to this uh, demon-possessed, this mute man. Some believe he was also deaf uh, in verse 32. So we'll just read very quickly. As they were going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, a mute man spoke. And the crowds marveled, saying, Never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he casts out demons by the prince of demons. So this is significant. Because if we go back again to Isaiah 35, we're not going to have it on the screen, but Isaiah 35, 3 to 6, it says this. It says, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. In other words, the Messiah is going to come and give a foretaste of his kingdom. So you've got blind people seeing, you've got mute people speaking, you've got lame people walking. It's a foretaste of what's to come in the fullness of the kingdom. But the Pharisees' response of course, that he casts out demons by the prince of demons. Again, as we see every week, and we belabor the point, the Pharisees missed the point. Because Jesus' ministry on earth, the whole point is that Jesus has been, or sorry, that Satan has been defeated. Right, so while he still has dominion over this land for now, Jesus has been given authority to come when he comes again and have full power in this earth, full power over the heavens, full power over the earth, full authority. And we can tap into that now through his spirit in our lives. You know, that kingdom come, when we say from Matthew 6, 10 that we saw last week, your kingdom come, your will be done, your rule, your reign come in my life. Then we get an expression of the kingdom now. It's not the kingdom in his fullness when he comes a second time. But that is the point that the Pharisees miss that Jesus has conquered Satan, that he has no power over that. We're going to see that further in Matthew 12 in a couple weeks. So Satan, sin, all of its effects, uh, Jesus has authority over them all. So the bottom line of Matthew 8 and 9, and we started off by looking at at this, is that Jesus, first of all, possesses absolute authority in the world over everything. So there's two primary takeaways from this. First is that he reigns over us supremely. We submit to his lordship. We talked about that at numerous times, that when we call Christ Lord, we're essentially calling him our owner, that he owns every aspect of our lives. As we call on his kingdom to come, we are saying we give every aspect of our lives to you. If there are things that we hold back, he's not going to have that reign and rule in that aspect of our lives. So first, we submit to his lordship and everything. That's the first takeaway. The second, though, is that he loves us deeply. 
and that's important because his authority is selfless. You know, we saw at the very beginning, he says, don't tell anyone. He's not here to make a statement for himself, not here for power to rule over the Roman authorities as so many thought that he was going to. So the good news is that he has authority, but he loves us. He has authority, but he doesn't rule, us, rule it over us. He doesn't make us do anything. It is our own free will to respond to that. So that's the good news. He has authority, but he loves us. So he possesses absolute authority in the world, and as a result, he warrants absolute allegiance from the world. So as we look at these stories today, we see three types of people. Right, the first was the crowds. So we see the crowds are all throughout Matthew. They're always following Jesus around. They're watching everything that takes place, and they revere Jesus. You know, they, they, they're following around. They obviously think very highly of him. They're revering him. You know, we see the first miracle today. They responded in fear. By the last miracle, they're marveling. You know, so they revere Jesus. They're following him. They're admiring him. Again, they're revering him, but it's at a distance. Right? They're spectating. They like what they see, but they're not really getting too close. They're not getting very involved. They're just there for a show. So that's the first type of person we see. The next, of course, is the scribes, the Pharisees. The crowds revere him, but the proud reject him. They don't even pretend to like what Jesus is about. They just outright reject him. And we've talked before that they thought that they were among the righteous, that by observing the law down to the, literally the letter of the law, forgetting about its intent, they thought that they would be counted among the righteous, that they would be among those invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. They were trying to earn it themselves. So what we don't want to do is be like them. You know, we want to submit fully to Jesus' authority. What we want to be is like the last group. We want to be among the faithful who renounce everything to follow him. We want to be putting him first in our lives above all else. That we wouldn't just observe from a distance and think, well, that's a nice story. That's, you know, that uh, sounds like somebody that, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll read about him every now and then. Uh, maybe even I'll go to the church on a weekly basis. I might even go to a Bible study. You know, I might learn a lot of things. Uh, but don't ask me to, you know, affect my life in any way. Don't ask me actually to go and, as Jesus does, to, to feed the hungry and the poor, to, to preach the gospel to, to all people, and, and whatever that looks like in your context. That could be in your workplace. We say it all the time in your, in your school. Um, with David on the ship, uh, with Francis on the ship, um, wherever that is in your context, you know, that is what you're called to do, to have that be the first priority in your life. Because we can easily fall into... One, the scribes and Pharisees who we just want to read the Bible and get really good at knowing everything that it says and we can quote a bunch of scripture, but it doesn't mean anything. Or we'd be like the crowds who just like a good story from a distance but don't really want to get to, get, don't want to get our hands dirty. So the personal question then from Matthew 8 and 9 today is, in your life, will you gladly submit to the authority of Jesus? Again, not reluctantly, but gladly. You know, we saw that from the story of the potential disciples, that Jesus isn't begging for people to follow him. He's looking for people that want to follow him. He's looking for people that want to put him above all else, that aren't going to say, well, I'm going to follow you, but I have, you know, whether it be bury your father or, again, the example, I get something else I've got to do first. Just let me take care of this, and I promise I'll follow. Like, or I'll let you have authority over this part of my life, but I want to hang on to this other part right now because I'm not ready to let it go. You know, that's not what Jesus is asking for. He's asking for a complete dominion over your entire life. He has authority over everything, and we should respond in kind and recognizing that we have, again, the demons fear, they believe, they fear, and they recognize who Jesus is. If we had even that much belief, it's a starting point. You know, it's, it's not the end, but we need to recognize that our faith, our belief needs to not just be a head knowledge, it needs to be something that plays itself out in our lives. As we take this message, that it, again, it wouldn't just, because it's so easy to take this, it's easy for myself to take this, and okay, I've learned a lot. I've, I've, you know, I've seen this, now I know a lot of things. You know, I have a new perspective, but I'm not actually going to do anything about it. And 
Just pray that that would not be the case, that as we reflect on this, as we reflect on the message last week, on the Sermon on the Mount that we saw Jesus, his teaching and preaching, his word, but that he didn't just teach and preach, he also acted it out, he actually lived it out indeed as well. And pray that that would be the case in all of our lives.